Um, and in fact, I think we'll, we'll begin as long as you're quiet, we're ready. Um, I, I have the privilege, and I really do think it's a privilege, to work here as part of the unusual, in fact, you could argue uh, unique public policy initiative of the, of the Marquette Law School. One of the main goals of this initiative, and Mike Goucher, who is the uh, spearhead of, of, especially of this side of things, is in, in the room today, and I uh, thank him for being helpful in, in uh, leading up to this program and for all he does here. But one of the main goals is to further level-headed, serious discussion of serious issues, um, which is exactly what I'm hoping and uh, we will be doing here today. Um, the history of this, in short, is that State Representative Dale Kawanga got in touch with us uh, a few months ago and said he wanted to debate the uh, president of the Milwaukee Teachers Union. And I frankly wasn't entirely sure what to make of that uh, as a good idea. I, I remembered one of my, uh, I thought it was an interesting idea, but I remembered one of my grandchildren last summer thought it'd be an interesting idea to hit a wasp nest that he spotted in our backyard with a wiffle bat. <laughs> And uh, we managed to intercept him before he did that. We hadn't spotted the, from his viewpoint, he could spot this nest more easily than we could. On the other hand, this is exactly what we want to do, is to get people with differing views, and there's no secret about that, to have a dialogue in hopes of informing ourselves, informing a broader audience, of furthering discussion of these uh, important issues. Now, uh, one thing you may notice, I, 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 in any case, I, I told, I told uh, Dale, if the two people would agree to do it, we'd agree to host it. He got in touch with Kim Schrader, the president of the Milwaukee Teachers Education Association, who immediately agreed, and so we proceeded. One thing you may notice here is that Kim Schrader isn't here. Um, Kim is unfortunately out with pneumonia. He's been sick for a week now. So Lauren Baker, the executive director of the uh, MTA, agreed at uh, somewhat the last moment, or the last 27 hours, to uh, step in, um, which was good because I nearly passed out at my breakfast table yesterday morning when I got the email from Kim saying he couldn't make it. So we're very appreciative of both of these people being here and the roles they've played and their willingness to be part of this um, discussion. As we uh, uh, know, there is a lot to discuss here. There are strong feelings on important issues. And we are going to make this, I, 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 I told uh, Dale from the start, I'm not going to label this a debate. It's a dialogue, a conversation. Um, they're not running against each other for office. Um, and, and that's exactly what we want to have is a conversation here on, on these serious issues. As part of that, I'm going to ask that this is an academic setting. In fact, this is actually a courtroom. If you pull back this wall, this has been used as a full courtroom, and, and it, um, that's what it was designed for. So I'm going to ask for no interruptions and uh, no uh, audience participation, except for applause at two points. And then the last 10 to 15 minutes, we will take questions from the audience. Um, and I do want to say at this point, I'm going to be looking for questions and not speeches. Um, but there are two points where I'm eager to encourage you to uh, show your appreciation, one of which is right now that we want to welcome State Representative Dale Poenga and Lauren Baker here. And we appreciate your willingness to join us here at the law school. Um, I'm going to ask each of you uh, for what's more or less an opening statement, if this was a debate, which it's not, but in the form of a question on what do you hope, what do you think should happen in the next, say, five years to improve the overall situation for Milwaukee school children? 
This is your idea. You get to go first. <laughs> All right. Well, first of all, I want to thank Alan. Um, in no order of priority here, the thank yous go out to Alan and Marquette University for hosting this event. Marquette University has been open to having dialogues and engaging more in the Milwaukee community, and we need more dialogues in this community. I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. You're obviously here because you care about education, and one of the things I hope we come away from today is that despite different perspectives on education, that we all care, and that should be a starting point to have some serious dialogue. I'd like to thank my wife who came out, uh, Jennifer. Jennifer, we met in public accounting, and she then became a teacher, and she taught very briefly at Nicolay High School, and now does, uh, we have four kids, eight and under, and she spends a lot of time on our kids' school board, and uh, she also has a passion for education, so it's uh, great to have her support in so many different ways. Um, I understand what Kim is feeling right now. I was really knocked out uh, early March, and I know I wouldn't be up for the debate then, so I hope Kim feels better, but I also want to thank him for um, agreeing to do this, and I'll be sure to follow up with him for an invite for a beer, and hopefully we can hash out all the problems we have there and be okay. And then uh, finally, I'd like to thank Lauren for stepping up. Uh, she got a call yesterday with uh, very short notice and says, let's go. So I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I have two objectives I want to do, be here. I think a lot of you folks say, oh, he's going to come and he's going he's gonna to just be a pro-charter school guy. He's going to come and be a pro-choice school guy. Or he's going to be pro the opportunity schools idea. And actually, I'm not here to necessarily advocate for one type of solution. What I think we need in Milwaukee is two things. First of all, we all need to be open to change. We all have to be open to change. Because I'm a conservative that believes that there's social injustice in Milwaukee. There's a significant amount of social injustice in the city of Milwaukee. And the great majority of that social injustice can come right back to our school system. It comes right back to our school system. We cannot accept the status quo, and we need to be open to change. Number two is the current rhetoric is not working. The current animosity across all systems, I say all systems across choice and charter and public schools, the, the fist, the chance, the dialogue on both sides is not conclu conducive to what's really going to make the most change in our community. And it's not going to be public policy. What's going to make the most change in our community is recruiting the best and brightest teachers from around the world and bringing them here to Milwaukee to improve our educational situation. And so that's why I want to get out of today's debate, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Great. So I think thank you for inviting me today. <laughs> um, it is true that Kim Schrader owes me big time. <laughs> um, but I do appreciate the invitation. Milwaukee Teachers Education Association is always happy to come before people in our community who are concerned about education and talk about the issues in an honest and open fashion. I really appreciate Alan's characterization as a wasp nest. I'm thinking about that one. I like that one. That might be a new graphic. I'm sorry, but I, that wasp nest thing is appealing to me because I think we are in a place in education in our community where there are a tremendous amount of injustices, I'm going to say being perpetrated on our children in this community. For 25 years, this community has been an experiment on the children of Milwaukee. I think we're going to get an opportunity today to talk about some of the different aspects of that. Obviously, Representative Kuyenga has been um, instrumental in the development of certain policies. Um, and I know that we're going we're to have a chance to talk about those today. Um, I do want to say that um, I hope that what we come out of today with is a vision for the kinds of schools we want our children to be in, and that that vision really encompasses the, both the kind of learning that we want to see in our schools, the kind of environment we want our children to be in in that learning, the kind of resources we want wrapped around those schools, and the kind of governance that makes that happen. I believe that model exists in community schools, and I'm going to talk about that more as we go on today. Because I think that that's something that every person in this room can agree on in terms of the vision that we'd like to have for our kids as we move forward. So I know we're going to get a chance to talk about um, a lot of these issues today. I'm going to keep that wasp's nest thing back there, though. I just I kind of like it. 
Um, and I just want to, just in, as I close, um, I'm going to take exception to one thing that Dale said. Um, and it's probably not going to be the first thing I take exception to, but uh, uh, we'll be very, we'll be very um, collegial about it. Um, I do think that this is a debate about public policy. I do believe that this is a debate about policy and our will as a public to believe in and trust our community and our children. By the way, these two people have not met before today, nor had uh, Kim Schrader ever met uh, Representative Kwanga. So uh, that's, that's one of the biggest arguments for doing this, is that sense of dialogue. Let's start with money. Um, is there enough money in the system? Yeah, we could always, I think education across all the spectrums can actually use more resources. I have no doubt for that. And that's why I've been proud. I think this, this is one of the things I want to do today is take the misconceptions out there and talk about those. The misconception is that we have been cutting education every year since we've been in office. Uh, what has happened is that when we took office, Republicans took total control of Madison from Democrats back in 2011. We were given a checkbook that necessarily wasn't balanced. We were handed a difficult financial situation. In result of that, you saw Act <coughs> 10. And Act 10 wasn't only about a financial fix for the state of Wisconsin, but it was also about a tool to try things differently in our classrooms. Since Act 10, there has not been a cut to education in Wisconsin. We have followed an increase in education spending approximately with inflation. And I think there's this, this dialogue out there that we continue to cut education. That is not true. Now, there's in different districts, it depends on your population of students, your property values. But generally speaking, we have made a commitment to continue to fund our schools. In addition to that, what we've done is we want to move the conversation for the correct amount of funding from a school from the politicians of Madison to the local community. And so you're seeing that. Every school district has the power to go to their community and say, we need more money, we'd like to have a referendum. And most of those referendums have passed. Actually, the vast majority of those referendums have passed. And that's the system we put in place, is let's keep up funding our schools. I'd like to do a little bit more than inflation still. But let's fund our schools. But let's also make sure that the, it could go to the voters. But here's what I really want to point out, is that the well, two things. First of all, we talk about the inputs in education. We shouldn't talk about the inputs in education. We should talk about the outputs. And so frequently in education, particularly from the Milwaukee Teachers Union, we hear about the inputs. How much money is going into education? What we should be focused on is the outputs. And the outputs since 2011 are remarkable. We have significantly closed the gap in Wisconsin between minority students and white students. Our graduation rate in Wisconsin is up. Our ACT scores are still among the highest in the nation. So we've arrived at no promised land, but by nearly every single metric, we are better today in 2016 than we were in 2011 when the dialogue was that we were decimating public education. So I'd like to do more for um, the funding, but I think we need to have a different focus as far as um, our priorities. And the last thing I'll add on that is that we should have a student-centered focus, not a school-centered focus or a district-centered focus. And a lot of times when you have that money conversation, they're focused on funding of the districts. We need to focus on funding students. And I'll talk more in the future. I'm sure there are more questions that talk about this topic. But we need to have a student-centered approach, not a district-centered approach, not a school-centered approach, not an adult-centered approach, but a student-centered approach to how we fund education. I agree that we should have a student-centered approach to how we fund education. And I'd like to talk about what that actually means. Because in the Milwaukee Public Schools, the revenue limit that dictates how much money our state thinks that student is worth in the Milwaukee Public Schools is $10,261, okay? Now, I don't know, does everybody understand the revenue limit thing? This is kind of geeky, but I'll take a minute and I'll step aside and just describe what that means. Okay, so revenue limit is what you get from the state and state aid plus what you're allowed to levy in property taxes. And there's a limit on that, okay? The limits were set back in the 1990s. It's where it is. It's been there for 25 years. But that is the amount of money that basically our state says an average kid in any school system gets, okay? And in the Milwaukee Public Schools, that's $10,261. In the Elmbrook School District, that's 11568 I won't make you guys do the math in your head. 
That's $1,307 more per pupil. That means in the Milwaukee Public Schools, my kids are worth $1,307 less than they are in Elmbrook. I have about 70,000 kids in Milwaukee Public Schools. If I multiply that number by 1,307, I get about $106 million annually. Do you know what? Milwaukee Public Schools could do with that $106 million annually. I mean, I envision libraries in every one of our schools that are open every day of the week, not just the one day a week that the librarian can get there. I imagine, I, I come out of the career and technical education world, I imagine beautiful health career and engineering labs and art teachers and music teachers in every school with 106 extra million dollars a year. And I don't mean to pick on Elmbrook. Um, Fox Point, uh, the per pupil cost is, uh, uh, the per pupil limit is $13,577 per pupil. That's $3,316 more than that kid is worth in the Milwaukee Public Schools. Now, I, I can, I'm looking at your faces. I don't think anyone thinks this is a good situation. Our children should be worth the same no matter where they are. Our children should, by, by our state standards, our children should be worth the same. And this is not like some, you know, like idealistic pipe dream. The state of California has done this where they just said, bam, this is what every kid in the state is worth. Now, there is other funding that comes in after that. And sometimes people talk about the total funding in a school district. But that total funding includes different categorical aids, federal monies, like, for instance, Title I, which comes in huge amounts of money. But remember, in a school district like MPS, that Title I money then leaves the school district and goes to the different private voucher schools where those students may be who qualify for Title I. So my question is, would you support then raising the charter and choice amounts to make sure it's the same as Milwaukee Public Schools? You know, it's interesting you say that, and I'd actually love to have that conversation. But again, this is public money, so I want to have that conversation when you can tell me that all of those schools will obey the open meetings and open records laws in Wisconsin so that I can see how that money's being spent and so that I know the accountability standards are the same that they are for all the public schools who use that funding and that I know that there are highly qualified professional educators in front of those kids. I want to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. But I think even now we could have the conversation about our public system. We could have the conversation about creating fair funding for our children you know, and, and, I, and I, I have a hard time imagining anyone could disagree that we want to have all of our children worth the same in each one of our school systems. The Milwaukee public school system, my numbers are a little bit different than number, as far as your numbers, as far as how much MPS gets per student. But I don't want to make this a accounting argument. Uh, I don't think you want to have that either. I want to talk about the kids, okay? And I think it's a little bit disingenuous to say, oh, if you look at the suburbs, they have more money per kid, and so that's unfair, but not recognize that other schools in Milwaukee are getting less money per kid, and yet that is not an injustice. So if you have a doctor married to a lawyer, and they send their kids to Milwaukee Public Schools, they're going to get $11,000 per kid by your numbers. I'll go with your numbers. But if you have a single mother who makes $20,000 a year and sends her child to a charter or voucher school, that child's only worth two-thirds the funding that Milwaukee gets. And how do we reconcile that? So I am up for the discussion as far as a student is a student. And a student-centered approach, the amount of funding per child should be equal across those children, no matter what type of school they go to. Whether they go, no matter what type of school or system they go to, it should not matter. Well, and as I said, I th you know, Ellen, I don't know if you want to come no, in here. but keep going. Yeah, as I said, uh, you know, I, if I'm going to talk about, I'm going to speak as Lauren Baker, citizen. Okay, I pay taxes on my house. I've... Um, I'm a citizen who likes to see how my public dollars are being spent. So if I'm going to send public dollars to a private organization, then I need to know that I can have public scrutiny of those dollars. Actually, I need to know that there are publicly elected folks overseeing those dollars, and that at any time that I want, I can walk in and I can take a look at the records of how those dollars are being used. That seems to me very fair. And that if, this is, if these are schools we're talking about, then I want all of my children, if all my children in this state are going to receive the similar funding, I want all of my children to have the same accountability happening in that school. 
I think that those are really basic things. If we talk about those basic things, I can talk about different kinds of funding. Right now, I, di I just do find it interesting because I think that making the argument that all of our public school children in public systems from Elmbrook to Milwaukee, and I'm not picking on the suburbs. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not picking on suburbs at all. I think that's fabulous, and we have some g fabulous educational um, institutions in our um, suburban areas. But um, rural school systems, urban school systems, ex-urban school systems, that all of our children should actually be valued the same. So let me agree that we need to have accountability in schools. I actually think that there's room in Wisconsin. I am not defending the status quo. I am not defending the status quo. And I think that even the, the voucher schools right now that received, I think there has to be an extra layer of accountability. Why do I say an extra layer of accountability? Because we have accountability right now. We have accountability across all our systems that you could go to a different school. And that is within MPS. You could go with MPS, you could go to a different school. Now what's different about MPS is MPS believes that the schools can select kids, but you don't believe the kids can select schools. But yet charter schools can't select kids. And so what we need to do is have a more real dialogue about how this works because I'm not making this a public school versus private. I mean, the biggest choice program in the state of Wisconsin is open enrollment. It's public school to public school. And we're at a point in Milwaukee now where 80% of the children in Milwaukee are exercising some kind of choice. So back to accountability. I believe that some of the private schools that have accepted the voucher money need to have additional accountability. And I don't only say that for the children and the community, but I say that for the choice program. If the choice program is to be successful, they need to weed out the 20% that are not performing. And there are schools that are not performing, and there should be a system for the state taxpayer to say, you're out of the system. That has how, to how would that system work? Because the, the Republicans came into 2015 saying, this is our first priority, school accountability, and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Let me say, first of all, as I wrap this up and go to that, is charter schools do have accountability, because charter schools, by definition, every five years you need to go back to be authorized, and they're authorized in Milwaukee by places like uh, UWM, the Milwaukee City Council. Um, as far as accountability, I think the hang-up on that issue was how do you measure, you can't measure a snapshot, it shouldn't be what I call an accounting of balance sheet, it also has to be where you're going. For example, my minister's wife is a principal of a school called Cross Trainers, here in Milwaukee, they focus on homeless children. Obviously, you take a snapshot of a school that's focused on homeless children, you're going to get a pretty low reading proficiency, right? So I think that they felt as if there is a not the metrics yet to measure how a child progresses, because it's not a zero or one. It's not if you're reading proficient or not reading proficient. There is progress to be made there. And so we need to come up with a better, and I think the community has to come back together between now and January and figure out how we measure that and get accountability for those schools. Additional level of accountability. So I, I'd, like to, I'd like to step back a little bit. Um, you know, there are a couple of interesting things that you said, Dale, that um, like the, I, I, I'm, I was very interested by the 20% number. There's about 112 voucher schools in the city of Milwaukee. Um, there was just a report. In fact, Alan, I think um, you had someone on a panel um, with the, oh, no, no, actually it was uh, Mike Boucher had someone on a panel with it. Again. We look alike. It, yeah. <laughs> so I just, like, I just want all of you to think for a minute that someone 24 hours ago told you to prepare for this. So <laughs> I, occasion, I have some notes, and I occasionally miss one of my facts. But yeah, just think about 24 hours. Um, uh, but I do, Mike O'Shea recently had um, one of the charter advocates, actually, on his um, show. And they just talked about a report done from the beginning of the Milwaukee uh, Parental School Choice Program. 41% mm -hmm. of the schools have failed. Now, I want to be clear. That's failed in terms of they financially fell apart. That's not even the ones who have very low enrollment or have um, poor test scores. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm a little difficulty with saying that this is a program that has a 20% um, performance problem. And I have a, let, let, me, let me just finish, okay? <laughs> because, you know, I have a long list of, you know, of schools where, you know, daughters of our fathers who mismanaged their funding so badly they couldn't provide transportation for the children while their CEO is making six figures or the Life Skills Academy that closed in the dead of the night in the middle of the year forcing students and their families to scramble for 
um, uh, a new school while that school's managers were living in a five bedroom, three and a half bathroom house, or Travis Academy that received $4.6 million in 2014 with their CEO making over $200,000 a year, and 2% of the students were reading on grade level and 3% were doing math. I mean, to so me- if I can see there's bad voucher schools, would you can see there's bad public schools? I, I haven't this, interrupted okay. you, let's be polite. <laughs> Um, we'll get back to that, though. Yeah, we will get back to that. I mean, I think King's Academy is a great example. They started as a voucher school, then they went to be a city charter, but their performance wasn't up to par, so they went back to being a charter, so they wouldn't have to, uh, went voucher. back to being a voucher, so they wouldn't have to be accountable. We have a big problem here, and I will say, I will say, we have had a, we have had choice in the Milwaukee area. We have had some choice programs that actually worked. One of the best ones, one of the ones that worked actually the best, got eliminated in your first state budget, and that was, or got eliminated actually with um, the passage of the OSPP, and that was the um, uh, Chapter 220. Uh, take Dale's question, though. I mean, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, so you're really passionate about accountability of voucher schools. I'm there with you. What about accountability in public schools? Because the Opportunity Schools Plan is the accountability for public schools. So would you agree that there has to be, a public, there has to be accountability for public schools, for low-performing public schools as well? There, there is already. I mean, public schools are measured um, by countless measures at this point through the Department of Public Instruction. The, um, the public schools um, have, well, right now we don't have a state test, but we're working on that, but have had state tests, that they're measured by those state tests. Um, the public schools have um, a variety of accountability measures, things that actually put them on that list, that put a bullseye on them. Now, you say that the, the OSPP, which I'll call the takeover of our schools, is a plan to create accountability, which, um, I, I, have a, I have a difficult time understanding. So, because as far as I can tell, in the OSPP, what you're saying is the problem with these schools is governance. We have to take them away from a public school board and give them to somebody else. Now, arguably, the city of Milwaukee has more experiments in governance, probably a more diverse field of governance in public education than any city in the country and we have for the last 25 years, and it has not moved the needle. So I don't understand why governance becomes the issue, because that's a lot of what the takeover is about, is let's take these schools away from Milwaukee Public Schools and we'll give them to a vendor, and that vendor's going to do something different. But there's schools that have moved the needle. If you look at charter, charter schools that are non-instrumentality charter schools, I mean, these schools have outperformed the typical public school. If you, there's failing voucher schools, there's no doubt about that, but if you look particularly at the Lutheran and Catholic schools, they on average are outperforming the public schools. But there are really good public schools as well. I do not deny that. But really what we're trying to do with the opportunity schools is that we're actually trying to save the public schools. The, the, the plan actually takes these schools and it tries a new approach and it hands them back to Milwaukee public schools. And it says you could do it any way you want. You can make these traditional public schools. They could be charter schools. And they could be uh, non-religious uh, um, non private schools, if you want. Charter schools are not a Republican invention. They were invented by a Democrat out of Minnesota. Nationwide, Democrats support charter schools. Governor um, of New York, Cuomo, supports charter schools. You have Rahm Emanuel in Chicago that supports public schools. You have Barack Obama that supports char charter schools. But it shows you the friction in our community that we cannot stand up and also like charter schools are Republican creation. They're not. The Democrats and Republicans have been partners in charter schools that provide flexibility for new, new ideas across the whole nation. We agree other, on something. Okay, but also other people have supported charter schools. Bernie Sanders has historically supported charter schools. Hillary Clinton, before she got the nomination from the teachers union, supported charter schools. That is a fact and all of a sudden, it's this toxic thing because it provides more flexibility. Because sometimes what you need to do to change is you need to tell your teachers, listen, we're in a tight spot. We're all going to get here at 7 a.m. We're not leaving at 5 p.m. And you need to do that sometimes. Well, and so, actually, actually and we one, do, more one more point. We do point. that every day. And then we take our work home with us at 5 p.m. And we work on it until I, midnight. So let's go easy on that one, okay? Well, I'm just saying that there's, there's teachers that do that. I, no doubt the majority of teachers do that. 
But there's also schools where teachers don't do that, and they need to be told, like, this is the way we need to do to turn the needle and do something different. That has to happen. There has to be. And if and I would offer this to you. If the union thinks they could run a school, and, like, you could run a school. You could go to the opportunity schools and say, we know how to do education. You could run a school. And I encourage you to try that. And it's actually been tried in New York City, and it failed. It did not work. Because they found when you actually okay, try to tell. We're, cover, we're covering a real lot of ground. I'm going to end with this. Can we take a breath? That just recently, in December 2015, the No Child Left Behind was, Act was gone and was replaced with a new educational standard, Every Child Succeeds. Right. It was voted on by both Tammy Baldwin and Ron Johnson and signed by Barack Obama. In that bill, it said states need to come up with a plan for their 5% worst performing schools. We have to do something. Barack Obama, Tammy Baldwin said we have to do something. Okay, what else could that be? Because Opportunity Schools is addressing the bottom 0.7% of our lowest performing schools. We have 4.3% to go. And the Opportunity School says you can pretty much do anything you want. Just do something different. Can we so take what? a breath? So there's the about four things I need to comment on here. Okay. okay? <laughs> but I'll do it. I promise I'll be brief. I'll be briefer. One is you're not debating the Democratic Party. Uh, and I'm not even pretending to be the Democratic Party. And I have a lot of differences with uh, President Obama and others on this particular issue. So just let's, you know, if you, you want to talk about them, call them up and talk to them. Um, second, uh, I take issue on the, this, um, uh, something that was thrown out there very randomly and just kind of settled on the audience about non-instrumentality charter schools and MPS outperforming MPS schools. I'd love to put the facts and figures up. Because I think, and Alan, you actually in your March 19th article um, where you were sort of summing up some history of how different sectors have worked, actually mentioned very specifically that Milwaukee Public Schools does teach a more challenging group of kids. And while I realize that, um, you know, Henry Tyson at St. Marcus has, you know, depending on which PowerPoint presentation you're watching of his, has somewhere between 6 and 10 percent special ed kids enrolled. And in the non-instrumentality charters, I know at Carmen, she's got um, three and a half to five percent um, special ed kids enrolled. The Milwaukee Public Schools, on average, is dealing with 22 percent special ed children. And so we're we're we got to make sure we're not comparing apples and chimpanzees when we're comparing. Um, I think that's very important. But I want to hone in on on this point on that the um, OSPP, or as I call it, the Takeover Plan, is saving MPS. Tell me if you think this is saving MPS. So the voucher school program took about nine years to get 5,000 students in it, okay? Took about 14 years to get 9,000 students in it. And we have watched that program in the Milwaukee Public Schools drain $66 million per year from MPS. According to the takeover, according to the rules of engagement in the takeover plan, um, it would take three years to hit 5,000 students. It would take six years to hit 12,000 students. So let me talk about what that actually means, okay? Because in year one, let's say we do the maximum. In year one, three schools will be taken away from the publicly, democratically elected school board of the Milwaukee Public Schools and given to another authority to run, okay? So if they have about an average number of kids in them, let's say that's 1,300 kids who get removed from MPS. Um, the uh, Department of Public Instruction right now says the amount of money that will follow those kids will be $8,188. Again, unless you have your calculator, I'll save you from the math. That's $10,644,000 in year one. In year two, let's say we do another three schools. Now we're up to about 2,700 kids. I'm at $22.5 million. That leaves MPS. By year three, I'm at 5,000 kids, and I'm at over $41 million. Don't tell me you're trying to save MPS. Well, what you're focusing on there, you're focusing on what the dollars are for the system. I want to focus on the student. I think the Dale, the Dale's oh. It's not, and and don't applause. But the system I'm not is debating, made up of I'm students. not debating the Democratic Party. I understand that. But this is so painful because I want to get in the room with people in the Democratic Party and have these discussions, and I have. I'm not going to say names, but there's a lot of them. And what they say is, Dale, you're doing the right thing. Keep doing what you're doing. But you ought to understand the politics in the city. The politics in the city is that if I'm an elected official on the board or on the city council or in the mayor's office or on the school board, and if I stand up for change in education, any change, they are going to come and get me. 
That is a fact, and they're scared of you. They're scared of the teachers' union, and they have these conversations. But we can't. We can't be, because I'm scared of what's going on in our city. I'm scared when you see six-year-olds getting hit by stray bullets. Because what happens is when you have high schools that graduate 50% of their students, those other 50% aren't economically viable. And so they find themselves in this world, this underworld, this black market of using women and selling drugs. And it creates violence. This is not an economic issue. This is a humanitarian issue. And we've got to try something different. And I'll well, focus on, on the uh, OSPP. Well, what do you hope will come out of this? And how do you think it's going at this point? I think it's actually uh, we'll going well. We'll give Dale well. the first chance here since. I think it's actually going well. I think there's actually changes you're seeing that the Milwaukee School Board never would have done if they didn't have this pressure on them. I'm glad to see Maurice Thomas has his charter school. Specific? Yeah, Maurice Thomas has his charter school. I'm glad to see that. I don't know if that would have happened or not. I think he's a great young man. I think he is going to execute. I'm excited to see what's going to happen there. I don't think Carmen would have got Pulaski and doing part of a charter school in Pulaski. And let me address that they're, they're trying to, that they have a different group of students than MPS. It's a tougher group of students. I've talked to folks, and what happens is the number of students they're taking in have the same issues as far as reading challenges and difficulties. And when they spend time with these students, they're more likely to say, this isn't an issue that they can't read. We just need to create the education curriculum in a different way. There's a different way we could do that, and they pull those, pull those off. So I think there's a lot of different examples where there's changes. I think there's a sense of we need to do something now with an MPS, which is good. Um, but I think what I want to give from it is a quote. What I want to give from this whole thing is let's be open to change. And I think that, I mean, Chris Abley, talk about Democratic. It, Chris Abley is the person who appoints it. This is a Democratic elected person. I could have chose the governor. I could have chose the statewide DPI. I did not. I chose to have a Democratic election in our community and have that democratically elected person say, you know what, we're going to focus now on the system of 155 schools. By the way, I think Darian Driver is an amazing person. I think she's great. But you can't focus on 155 schools. And so what this does is it allows someone else to say, Superintendent Driver, we could focus on these three or five schools. We're going to turn them around. And when they're turned around, they go back to MPS. So on the first comment that you've talked to people, I think I know what school you're referring to, where they say they bring in these kids who have these special needs, but then they work with them and they discover the kids. So you know, just to be clear, I don't know how many people in the room are educators. So um, if you have dyslexia, you have dyslexia. If you have an attention deficit disorder, you have an attention deficit disorder. Um, and that's, you have an IEP for that. <laughs> Uh, that's an individual education plan. You are a special ed student. There are certain categorical funds that a school district gets to help you with that. You don't go somewhere and not become dyslexic anymore. You might perform at a higher level. You might be engaged in your learning. You know, you might uh, be able to uh, engage in social interaction. But you do not become not a special ed student. So the data from the Department of Public Instruction that says how many special ed students in your school is still the same data. It doesn't change because that kid goes to school there and gets a, a positive educational experience. You're still a special ed student. So um, in terms of why their numbers don't reflect that they have enough, uh, as high of the special ed students as other schools do, that's um, the argument that they come to the school and somehow lose that. Um, don't, you think be, don't you think children could be misdiagnosed though at times? I'm you sure children can be misdiagnosed also. Uh, I think more often than not, we actually misdiagnose, we, we fail to diagnose children who need um, extra special supports, and there's actually been a pretty big lawsuit in this state about that in the past. Um, but let's then, let's move over to um, what we're doing with the takeover. Okay, what we're doing with the OSPP. I, I love the fact that you complimented um, the superintendent, Dr. Driver, um, who, you know, as you can imagine, I'm the executive director of the teachers' union. Dr. Driver and I occasionally like disagree with each other. You know, we, once in a while we have heated exchanges, but I'm going to say five percent of the time. Um, overall, I think she has brought some very refreshing and positive leadership to the Milwaukee Public Schools. Um, I've seen some fairly remarkable things happening. And, you know, here we have a Harvard-educated PhD 
who has taught and worked in um, urban systems in a variety of different cities. And somehow we don't believe that her authority or expertise is as good as a county executive who, um, you again make the point is democratic as though that is enough for us to you know, just say yes, that's good. Um, that a county executive who I don't believe has a college degree and was not elected to oversee educational programming, um, who brought in a commissioner who seems like a very nice man and well-educated, um, who is a superintendent of schools, but who has also spent none of his professional career working with children in poverty. He was a child in poverty. He, he grew up, I don't know if he was in poverty, but he grew up I, in the Milwaukee public school system. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. And many people did. But there is a difference between people who actually forge their professional career and their professional learning in those environments. And, and he has, he's a nice man. You know, it's not, not to say anything negative about him personally, but that's not his experience versus a African-American female who has been through the Philadelphia public system, the Detroit public system, has honed her craft um, working with children in dire poverty and has come into this system and is actually pushing, I mean, she's got this fascinating initiative right now on high schools that I, I, as someone again who spent uh, 10 years as an administrator in the public schools working in career and tech ed, I was so excited to see the high school initiative. Yeah. Um, it's the expansion of Montessori schools, you know, a number of very positive things. And while this is happening, you're telling me that in five years, taking $41,144,000 out of the public schools is going to help Dr. Driver. So I look at it this way. Dr. Driver is in charge of 155 schools. If she was going to visit every single school and not go to her office, she, was, she would be at her office a dozen times a year. I mean, she cannot focus on that many individual schools. So you know, we talk about the strategic level, the operational level, and the tactical level. What we're looking at here is we want Dr. Driver to continue to execute and move things forward at the strategic level. But the tactical level, we want to take these schools and we want to try something different for three to five of them. We're talking about less than uh, two to three percent of the Milwaukee public school portfolio and simply try something different. So um, another school I've mentioned like, is, is Opportunity School is working. I mean, I have a lot of examples. I'll throw out Bradley Tech. Now, Bradley Tech is a school with a 50 percent graduation rate. And let me just say across all these systems and all these schools, they're still having kids coming out of these schools who are amazing, amazing students. Um, so we should never disparage a school or a system. Um, I have a soldier come to me the other day. He's been in my unit now for two drills. He's a Bradley Tech graduate. And I can't tell you how proud I am of him. And he's articulate, he's bright, and he's going to change the world. Um, but at Bradley Tech, 50% graduation rate, I think we would all say, is not acceptable. And when we were talking about the opportunity schools, it was no secret that Bradley Tech was one of the schools we were looking at. And as a as a consequence of that, what Bradley Tech has done and MPS has done is they formed a partnership with MATC, which I know you're intimately familiar with, and also MSOE, and they're going to try something different. And so I'm satisfied with that. I hope that they do not ch choose Bradley Tech as one of those schools because I want to see that through and I want to see change at Bradley Tech and I want Bradley Tech, that program, to work. I want MPS to work. And I know you disagree. But I believe this will help MPS be better. Okay. Let's talk so, about teachers. Oh, can I do one more thing? Oh, those Briefly. Are teachers. Briefly? Oh, those Briefly. Are teachers. OK. Bradley Tech, you, you, I mean, you definitely pushed one of my buttons there. I sit on the Bradley Tech Commission. And just to be clear, the plans that were underway happened before the OSPP legislation. I heard people would say, people would say differently. Okay, well, I, I, know I was. That's enough to be argued, but yeah, I okay, have I was there, say So I was there. Okay. Um, but I, based just, on what I know, you're both right. Okay. <laughs> in, in your own ways. Um, so what I want to I want to counter our vision of the takeover with a different vision, because instead of taking forty one million dollars out of the Milwaukee Public Schools, and the Milwaukee Public Schools is this island over here that continues to sink. Why can't we promote authentic community schools? Two years ago, the MTA was very excited to have worked with some local funders. Um, we put together a busload of 70 people, sent them down to the National Coalition of Community Schools convening in Cincinnati. That group of people, cross-section of folks, frontline educators, administrators, community members, um, you know, a, a great group of people went down and their eyes were opened to what has been a model working in urban school districts 
for the last 25 years in this country, there are over 6 million kids, over 6 million kids who are in community schools. Center for Popular Democracy just recently did as sort of an evaluation, taking a look at community schools. Alan, in fact, visited our Avenue School and himself said, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of challenges, but there's clearly something going on. Because when we talk about doing culturally responsive teaching, mm -hmm. when we talk about doing excellent teaching practices, wraparound services that our children in poverty in particular need to thrive in their learning environment, when we talk about positive behavior practices, not this, you know, not, not what some of our voucher schools do, which is expelling kids at um, very, very high rates. Um, we talk about inclusive school leadership where parents and educators and community members are all involved. There's a model there that works and it has nothing to do with governance. It has nothing to do with whether that school is run by the public school system. You don't have to take it from a publicly elected, democratically elected school board with the accountability that we know is built into that and hand it to a private operator to make that work. I mean, I, I don't, I think community schools make sense for some schools, but some things that you would have to forfeit is, I mean, you're gonna get rid of your magnet schools then? Because no. you having schools, well, those kids are being shipped to the city, the best and brightest are being sent to certain Milwaukee public high schools. That's not a community-based element to that. The other two is. That's not what a community school, community schools yeah. can actually use the entire city. They're not just, they're not neighborhood schools. That's a different model. Okay. A community school can use resources across the city. Well, also, another thing that we had to look at, I mean, the Chapter 220, as you mentioned earlier, like, why'd you get rid of Chapter 220? Because we support choice in education, but we think choice in education should be based on more of your social economic status, not your race, right? Like, we need to stop looking at people as, you know, black or white. We need to look at them as just people. And I think that if you look at someone who's, if you look at that legislation in the 1970s, it's grossly out of date. It talks about a community of white and non-white. I mean, as if that's like one homogeneous community of a non-white community. I think it's offensive. The legislation is actually offensive. So all we did is simply say, over 12 years, let's phase it out and just do open enrollment and, and the choice program. Um, so I mean, I'm not opposed to community schools, but I appreciate, I think that's the one issue, the one part where you may be open to some, some change. Teachers, I really want to talk about teachers. <laughs> let's talk uh, about teachers. Uh, in, in your opening remarks, Dale, you said, every. Everyone needs a great teacher, which is something that I think everyone in this room would agree with. Frankly, I hope it's something that more and more people can come around uh, uh, to gather around behind that. Uh, public Policy Forum, recent study, raised concerns about the teacher pipeline uh, throughout the southeastern Wisconsin area, particularly, I think, in the city of Milwaukee. What do we do to get better teachers? How are we doing at it? Uh, I, I should add that I think it's just a factual statement that teachers statewide in very large numbers, and no, I don't know a percent, feel like they're not appreciated. They're underappreciated. They're under, uh, uh, not even underpaid as much as, as, as uh, undersupported. Um, uh, some of this goes back to, to Act 10. Some of it is from broader sources. What do we do to make teaching uh, a more energized and attractive profession? I'm going to let Dale go first on this one. You get better management. I hear a voice. <laughs> <laughs> Teachers yes. are the most important profession in our country. Teachers are the most important profession in our country. The reason for that is is that we are a country that has pushed limits. We are a country that says, what's beyond those mountains? Let's head west. We are a country that said, we're gonna put a man on the moon. We're a country that says, there's no disease that we can't cure. We're a country that says, we want a world that doesn't have imperialism or communism or fascism. We want a country with democracy, and an economic system that works for all of us. Who are the people that push the minds of our young people? It's the parents and it's the teachers in the classroom. We need to support our teachers. And we need to support our teachers if they are in public schools or private schools or charter schools. And so we need to reward good teachers 
and I'll, I'll leave it at that. I could add a lot to it. I, I will add this one thing. I'll, I'll leave a question for you on this. Is we need to have managers that know what they're doing to have a wider selection of students to choose from. And we tried this unsuccessfully and got slapped down pretty fast in Milwaukee and you know, Madison. I think we need to message this better and talk about this. But we need to look at options and say, should we have reciprocity across the whole country and allow the local school districts and local administrators to decide who the talent should be in their classroom and not politicians in Madison? I'm hoping you would support statewide or countrywide reciprocity for teachers' licenses. So, you know, this is great. Like, up until about the last three sentences, you had me going. <laughs> <laughs> you that's know, the an, stuff about, an... like, teachers in our most important profession. And, I mean, seriously, you know, and I think, and I, I doubt there's a person in the room who would disagree with us on the importance of teachers. It's kind of why this room filled up probably within 10 minutes of, um, of, of the, the event opening up. This is a very hot subject, something people are terribly interested in, and everybody knows that that frontline educator is key to our future. It's absolutely true. So I say, what is it that helps us make great teachers, keep great teachers, and make people want to go into teaching? So I think uh, some folks, I recognize a few I, folks, and I know Alan was there. There was a public policy forum report just released recently looking at the teacher pipeline. Um, there was just a, a forum like in the last month down at Italian Community Center. Um, and, you know, it's a pretty stark reality since Act 10. Uh, so part of it is the financial picture. I mean, we crunched the numbers and an average teacher, kind of mid-career teacher in Milwaukee Public Schools lost about 19% of their compensation. Um, and so that's hard, you know, but I, you know, truth be to teachers don't go into teaching to get rich, is that's a good thing, um, because they won't. And you don't see teachers living on Lake Drive, and you don't see teachers vacationing in the, you know, Swiss Alps. It's not, you know, teachers didn't do it for that reason. Um, and so it's amazing to me how many blows teachers take because they're so committed to those children in their classrooms every day. But there's only so much you can load on people before they just say, I can't do it anymore. And we have vilified, we have vilified in this state the teaching profession and teachers in particular. We really have. And I can see a lot of heads nodding. A lot of heads who might not nod with me on everything I say, I know I see them nodding their heads. Um, and that was a message we heard at that public policy forum. There was a teacher there from, um, he's a math teacher, John Peacock from Ronald Reagan High School. And he talked about himself, he's a mathematics teacher, he went and got a CPA. Because he said he needed to prepare himself to take care of his family. He's got a little kid at home now. And he wanted to make sure, you know, and thank goodness for the kids in the Milwaukee Public Schools that he didn't leave. But my kids need a 1,000 more teachers like John Peacock. And I don't need them leaving the district. And, um, and if you take a look at what's coming into our, our schools of education, it's a trickle. And that's because of what we have told society about who you are if you become a teacher. You're responsible for every problem in the world. And anything that isn't solved, you're going to get punished for. And then I'm going to cut your paycheck, too, on top of it. You know, I have a good friend who's a nurse. And um, she, uh, when she graduated from nursing school, you know, she had to pass a test, kind of like teachers do, to get certified, essentially, as a nurse. She went to work in an urban hospital. And uh, asthma rates have been skyrocketing in urban communities around the US. No one blames the nurses for it. In fact, we kind of rely on the nurses' expertise to help us teaching better health care amongst our low-income families and helping children with interventions to deal with that asthma. With teachers, it's entirely the opposite. We don't trust them in dealing with the issues of poverty. We blame them for them. Before Act 10, what you had was you had a structure where what I call professional cannibalism and they would go into negotiations and say we have to balance our budget and they would say okay do you want to pay a little more for your health care a little more for your pension or is she, should we do layoffs and the answer was you should do layoffs and so the younger teachers with less seniority would be gone and that's not rewarding the best and brightest teachers that was a system based on how long 
you've been in your position. And so I think really when you're looking at the new system, we say, let's focus on the individual. We negotiate with the individual as opposed to a blanket for the whole system. I believe that makes more sense. And as far as increasing the pipeline of teachers, I know your union wasn't opposed to this, and I appreciate that, is that we lifted the residency requirements. We want teachers to stay in the system, so we say you can live, if your husband has a job on Delafield, or you know, they have a job in Chicago, you want to live halfway, like we want good teachers to stay. That's what we did for your members, is we said you could live, did nothing? Did zero. Okay. In, fact, in fact, you can talk to a lot of the suburban school districts around us, and they will tell you what excellent teachers we have in Milwaukee Public Schools, because my teachers leave MPS to go someplace where they're going to have more resources in their okay. classrooms. I was really confused when I was in the parade last year, when that teacher ran out to me and shook my hand and said, thank you. Because I've heard from teachers that said, thank you very much for lifting teachers up the requirements. Pe teachers appreciated it, but it did not increase. You can go to the MPS website and look at all the job openings. It did not actually change the reality for Milwaukee Public Schools' ability to recruit teachers. It just gave teachers more opportunities for where they could live. And on the flip side, it gave a larger population of teachers for good administrators to choose from. Let's figure we're not going to solve all these problems here. <laughs> but let's take a few questions from the audience. It got to be a little later than I thought. Uh, I don't know where to start. Let's start uh, in the beige sweater there. If you, you got a, a little thing in front of you, if you push that. Yeah. I have a question about your Opportunity Schools program. It's been talked about as a change in governance, but it seems to me the way we're going to solve problems is to change the underlying rules and red tape that keep down innovation and structure within the individual schools. So is, is this something that the Opportunity Schools is going, isn't designed to address? The Opportunity Schools is supposed to be a clean slate to try something different. So here's what we're going to do, is we're going to say maybe it's a longer school year, maybe it's a longer school day, but we're also going to involve wraparound services. We have sat down with every single secretary in the state of Wisconsin and say, what do you bring to, what do you bring to the table? So if correction said, well, we have, we have nothing to do with these, we're not involved in these wraparound services, wrong answer. Because what we're going to make them do is at a school which has a high percentage of children with dads in jail, incarcerated, we're going to set up video telephone conferencing abilities so that their father in jail can read a book and they can read a book and they can connect with their father in jail on a weekly basis and form that bond. Because that will serve the, the individual that's incarcerated, it will serve the person in the school, we've got to form more of a community. So, these new schools are going to provide an opportunity to call a timeout and say, we have schools here with 0% reading proficiency and 0% math proficiency. Let's try something different. Let's bring new people to the table and see what we can do. You can't go down. But what's the worst thing that could happen in a school with 0% reading proficiency and 0% math proficiency? All of what you can do without removing schools from the Milwaukee Public School Board. I see one of our school directors back there shaking his head, in fact. Um, every one of those, we, in fact, we have some fabulous services currently working with Department of Corrections, working with a number of the state departments and local organizations that currently wrap services around our schools. Nothing to say we can't continue to do those things. There's no reason we have to change governance to do that. Another question. Okay, Lisa. My name is Jocelyn. Yeah. He said if they um, do not take the proposal, uh, the fear is that the legislature will come back with something more draconian. I wanted to ask Dale, what's next if MPS says no? And a companion question to this, my understanding is that there aren't a lot of providers that are just waiting in the wings to take over failing schools. Right. So if MPS says no, what's the plan? Well, I'll tell you what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to take my ball and go home because there's too many kids in this city that are in a tight spot because the current system's not serving them. Federal law, voted on by Tammy Baldwin and Barack Obama, says we need to do something with our 5% lowest performing schools. So if they're not going to try something different with this small number of schools, three to five a year, then we're going to go back to the table in January. I know Alberta Darling is right there with me. And our caucuses on both sides of the aisle, we get in that room, and we talk about what we see and the conversations we have on education in Milwaukee, and they listen. 
and we're not going to leave these kids behind. If the Milwaukee Public School doesn't want to try something differently with these schools, then we'll go back to the drawing board. Or I would encourage Dr. Means and Chris Abley to take a more aggressive approach. I mean, they, Chris Abley just won an election. He won an election handily. And I'm sorry, but his opponent was the first person ever to run for office, ever, say, I'm not going to do something for failing schools. This is not relevant. And Chris Abley won handily that election. The people in Milwaukee want change. The people in Milwaukee want change. The legislation empowers Chris Abley and demand means. The community has empowered Chris Abley through the vote. And they're still trying to make a deal with Milwaukee Public Schools because they know and I don't agree what they came up with, but they know the friction in the education committee is not good for what we need, and that is to have the best and brightest teachers in our schools. Briefly, we'll try to take one more question after this, but we do have to wrap up soon. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, the proposal that was presented to the Milwaukee Public School Board is not in sync with the legislation. There are pieces of it that are not the same as the legislation is. Um, I think that that causes a lot of confusion and anguish for the school board to make a decision in terms of whether they follow the law or they follow a proposal that's put in front of them. I am not on that school board, but I will say that if the issue at hand is to provide wraparound services, to respect teachers, to create innovation, all of that can be done without changing governance. The key in the takeover is that you have to change governance. And I, and I still, I have not heard a compelling reason why governance needs to change. Every one of the things that Dale has said here that he wants to see, why won't we, why won't we try this? Why won't we try that? Milwaukee Public Schools has the largest footprint of Montessori schools in the entire country. Talk about an innovation. Milwaukee Public Schools has done programs and projects. They have the largest implementation of Project Lead the Way in the country. I know that for sure and was an early implementer of it. This is a school district that's not afraid of innovation. This is a school board that's not afraid of innovation. I don't know why governance has to change to make that happen. Do we all agree that maybe we have a bigger, we, we have a social problem that money and systems are just too much challenged by, that the, the solution will come from our solving our social problems before we throw money and systems at it? Can we go first, guys? Yeah, go on. Yeah, go on. Yeah, yes, excuse I me. Yeah, I, I really haven't been keeping score, but you're... Yeah, yeah, I just want to go first once. Okay. <laughs> um, our educational systems can help impact, but you're absolutely right. You know, there was a great graph that showed up in the New York Times, I think it was like about uh, three weeks ago, the story, and then it's been translated to Wisconsin, where they did one of these scatter plots, and you can map out um, a socioeconomic status and educational performance. And the correlation between poverty and educational performance is extreme. Does that mean that poor children can't learn? Absolutely not. But it does mean that we need to provide the resources to help children in poverty with the social emotional learning, with the, the physical and mental resources that are available in our communities which is exactly why community schools is the thing that can help us begin to address the inequities and the poverty that surrounds our children, that our children carry with them every day to school, eager to learn, eager to perform at their very best, but they need the assistance to do that. And we have a model that has shown proven, that has proven itself in other urban areas to help deal with that. I I, there's no doubt, I agree with the, that kids in poverty can learn. I think there's sometimes this, this comment like, oh, they're poor. That Kids are kids and kids can learn even if they're poor, but although the challenges are hard to overcome. And the question is, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Does poverty come first and then bad education, or bad education followed by poverty? I don't know, but I think that if you solve your education problems, if you try new ideas, you're more likely to have less poverty. And let me just say who I am. <laughs> I am a Milwaukee progressive, and let me explain that. If conservatism, and hear me out on this, if conservatism means to keep the status quo, I am not happy with the status quo. The idea in Milwaukee of trying something different is to elect a socialist. Republicans have not been in charge. Conservatives have not been in charge of Milwaukee. This is larger than just education. This is larger than a whole community. And we have to say, are we happy with the status quo? And I do represent the city of Milwaukee, but this is one giant Milwaukee community. 
And we can't be happy of where we're at with our crime, with our poverty, our education. And the bottom line is we have to try new ideas. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, uh, with some regret, say <laughs> we're going to stop here. But we're going to stop here for today. I really believe these kind of exchanges are valuable. They're thought provoking. I hope they get all of us a little bit riled up to think more. I think it's a good thing that these two people have been, in, are, who are both very important to what's going on here, have been willing to spend their time and effort doing this and have met each other. I'm going to make it my own job to try to think of more ways to do this. I want to thank them. I want to thank you. I want to thank the law school for making this possible. But I especially want to applaud these two people. Thank you, Representative Kalanga. Thank you, Lauren Baker.